Hey, what's up? This is Scott Talensky, and today we're talking about JS Nation, a conference going down November 18th in New York City, but it's also a hybrid conference on November 21st. And joining me today is Carson Gross, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Carson's talk that's happening at JS Nation. And if you want to attend, I'll have a discount link in the description below that you can sign up. And by all means, it's an incredible conference, one of the best I've ever attended. So head on out to New York or check out the Remote Hybrid Conference as well. It's really super good. So Carson is an instructor over at Montana State University, and that's out in Bozeman. Can you tell me a little bit what that's like, Carson, being an instructor? Um, it's good. I, I, I like, I've learned a lot about computer science, you know, <laughs> you, you learn a lot more when you teach stuff. And, uh, so uh, one of the, uh, ironies is I, I actually teach. So I dropped out of computer science at Berkeley, um, because I just, I couldn't handle, uh, a class and I actually teach that same class now. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I teach it very differently. I don't like the way it was taught at Berkeley, but, uh, it's, it's, so it's really good from, I mean, you know, I enjoy teaching. I like helping students understand stuff. I try, I tend to, I, I try to have a lot of visual like emulators and stuff like that. Cause I find that helps people understand. Uh, a lot of people are very visual. It, it is a little tough sometimes because I find myself switching between different topics. I mean, web development is crazy, right? Like it, you got to know database, CSS, HTML, like, you know, all this other stuff, maybe a JavaScript library, 10. Um, and uh, so uh, that's good preparation for teaching because with teaching, it's like, okay, databases, okay, like assembly and machine code, <laughs> like, okay, now web development and that, you know, so it can be very challenging. Uh, in that regard, but, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I like my students a whole bunch, uh, university can be a little bureaucratic, but that's mm -hmm. just the way that it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I totally relate to that. I think there's a number of, uh, web classes that I, I took in college that, I would love to do differently myself. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is nice. Like my compilers class, same thing. Like I teach compilers the way I wanted, want to teach it, which is with recursive descent and everything. You do everything by hand basically. Um, well, and, uh, it's a, it's a lot more, I think it's one of these things where it seems like that would be more work, but it's actually about the same amount of work. And it, I find it teaches people the concepts much better. Nice. Um, so you know. sick. Well, you created one of the most beloved new JS libraries, HTMX. Can you tell me what inspired you to make HTMX? Um, so HTMX came out of Intercooler JS, which it's been around forever. Um, Inter I released Intercooler back in 2013. And that library, it was an internal library. I was using it as a startup before that, like as far back as 2011, I think. And uh, basically it was a, a JavaScript library that extends HTML. So um, you don't, you, it's a JavaScript library, but you don't write JavaScript to use it for the most part. And uh, instead uh, you put attributes on HTML elements and that drives like a really simple Ajax, basically Ajax requests. So just as a very basic example, uh, you can put an attribute like HX post on a button, just a plain button that isn't in a form and have that button issue a post to a URL. And then that the response with HTMX is expected to be HTML. So like some partial, typically a partial bit of HTML. And then there's a couple other attributes you can use to specify where to put that response. So I want you to, you know, replace this element with the response or whatever. Um, so it's a pretty simple little concept uh, like that. And I just, you know, I was back in 2011 or 12, I was, uh, there, there was similar functionality. It wasn't baked into HTML, but there was similar functionality available in jQuery. And I uh, found that's what everyone was using back then. And I found out about it and was, and used it successfully in a couple projects. And that's when I started creating this function that sort of wrapped up some of the behavior. And then I saw Angular 1 and the way they used attributes to drive mm. behavior and said, okay, I'm going to, instead of having, you know, having to call my library that I've built up, I'm going to use attributes to drive that. And then that eventually got, you know, I, I started to understand the, um, the concepts around, uh, hypermedia and HTML better. Cause I, uh, especially after I open sourced it, had people come and explain to me like, Oh, this is cool. This is actually real, like real rest. And, uh, so 
I, I started to understand kind of what I had done. It's another one of those situations where you kind of have to do something before you understand it. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> so, so I did it, and now I really have a much better understanding of it to the point I'm, you know, I'm publishing academic papers on hypermedia at this point. So, so that's sort of where it came out of. Um, and it, you know, I guess like at the bit most base level, it was just me. I didn't want. I, I kind of liked the web model of like request replace, you know, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the more complicated stuff, especially back in the day with like knockout, if you remember knockout JS oh, yeah, and, yeah. and angular, um, one, I just was like, eh, this is too much for what I want. It's more than I need. And, uh, I can do most of what I want with this other simpler model. And so wrote that for a while. And then, you know, when COVID hit, I rewrote it without the jQuery dependency intercooler was dependent on jQuery, um, which was fine in 2011 or 12. Cause everyone, <laughs> everyone, yeah, was using everyone. JQuery. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's uh, JavaScript is standardized and gotten a lot better. And so it was feasible to, to pull that requirement, pull the dependency out. And uh, now it's sort of a standalone library. Yeah. Yeah. You have a, a I mean, HTMX included has a big focus on simplicity in that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's using HTML forward. It's, it's obviously it's, it's not a lot of you know, handwritten JavaScript to do a lot. Like you said, yeah. you're using attributes and it. it's it's really super effective in that regard. Yeah. Uh, you wrote a really great essay called The Grug Brain Developer. Can you tell <laughs> me about that essay? Yeah, uh, that was an essay. I just had a friend. Uh, I was chatting with a friend and I started just, you know, being like a caveman in the chat because we were talking about <laughs> the design of something. And I just started jokingly uh, talking like a caveman. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to take that and just do an essay, like not even an essay. It. Like I was like, I'm just going to write down all the random stuff that's like knocking around in my head after, you know, 30 plus years of programming. Um, and uh uh, but I'm going to do it as a caveman. And I did it. And I like, just as a joke was like, okay, I'll put it up on a website and like <laughs> buy a domain for like, it was like an internal joke with this other guy that I was talking with, that I was working with. And so I kind of put it up and he was like, oh, this is great. This is so funny. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I think I posted it on the HTMX discord and someone ended up poking, uh, posting it on Hacker News and it's, it's gotten more traction on Hacker News than anything like useful I've ever written, <laughs> like any of the it's academic super good. stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah I mean, it is, you know, I don't know. Some people probably don't like it, but, uh, it is a lot of like things I've learned over time and a big, you know, one of the big overarching messages of that essay is like simplicity is, is like the most important thing. There's an essay or it's a, it's actually, it's part of a larger essay. Um, if you've ever read worse is better, have you ever heard of that paper? No. No. So worse is better is a, uh, it's a, it's a chunk taken out of a larger essay by a guy named Richard Gabriel, who was a, he was a Lisp developer and he was trying to figure out how come Lisp lost, like how could Lisp mm. have lost to C? Cause you know, Lisp developers look at C the way maybe like Rust developers look at JavaScript or something like, <laughs> like, it's just like, what is this garbage? You yeah, know? yeah. And, uh, so maybe even more so. Uh, and so his, uh, he, and he, he did something that I think was pretty cool intellectually. He was like, okay, I'm not just going to say, no, it's the people that are wrong. I'm actually going to analyze why Lisp lost and why mm. C won. And, uh, sort of the crux part of that essay, a guy named Jamie Zelinsky found and started mailing around and it became no known as the worst is better essay. And in there he talks about like different approaches to uh to software development and one the the worst is better approach uh really focuses on simplicity, simplicity of implementation in particular. And uh he, so Gabriel even though he's not a worst is better person, he argues that it has better survival characteristics in the long run from a software perspective. And so that's that that there's some influence of that essay throughout the Grug Brain developer. There's a lot of very practical things, like you know, like I'm not a huge fan of unit te of test first mm, development mm -hmm. and like unit testing. I think you should you can write some unit tests to get going, but then really to me the mo more valuable tests are the integration tests that start Same, to yeah. get up a little higher in the abstraction levels, so that you're not because when you when you do unit testing of like little teeny chunks of code, then you you kind of you're committing to that chunk of code, and particularly early on in a project like that 
code might be wrong. You might be getting your abstractions wrong. It's hard to get them right at the start. And so, uh, so just a little tidbits like that, um, kind of, but all written as a caveman. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I love it. Give that a, a read if you haven't, and I'll make sure to check out worse is better. Uh, it seems like a super influential, uh, yeah. so your talk at JS nation is titled HTMX is pro JavaScript. Can you yeah. give us a, a breakdown about your talk and maybe just a, a quick preview of what it, what's it about? Yeah, it's so um, there's a so HTMX, you know, as, as we sort of talked about, like you don't you tend not to write as much JavaScript when you use HTMX for your web application, particularly when compared with, you know, if you're writing like a React based application or something like that. Um, you just it, the focus isn't as much on JavaScript. And because of that, there's uh, uh, um uh, the HTMX has a reputation as being a library that people who hate JavaScript use. Um, and so I wanted to, that's true to an extent. Like if you don't like JavaScript, you're going to like HTMX in mm -hmm. relative terms because you don't have to deal with as much JavaScript. Um, but I think there's another way to look at it where you can say that HTMX is actually pro JavaScript in that um, it allows JavaScript to be what it was designed for, which is a scripting layer for the web. Um, um, you know, JavaScript was not designed like it was a it was a lisp that they kind of had to weld Java syntax on top of. Um, but it was designed. You can go and watch interviews, which I've been doing in preparation for this talk of uh, Brendan Ike, the guy who created it. And he was like he talks about, oh, it's just it was a way to just make a button do mm -hmm. a thing. You know, and uh, JavaScript's really good at that, actually. Um, there's aspects of the language. You know, I teach programming languages like compilers, and I've got my own opinions on languages. Um, and so there's things I'd change about JavaScript. But for for light front end scripting, for scripting in a web context, like it's it's that's wheelhouse for JavaScript. And uh, if you use HTMX, you can actually use JavaScript in that way. So it takes this pressure off of JavaScript to be a good general purpose language to, you know, be, to support a massive code base of JavaScript, which it's a dynamic language, big code bases are not <laughs> wheelhouse for dynamic languages, but just getting little things done. Um, that's, that's, uh, again, that's, that's really what, uh, one of the str strengths of JavaScript. And so HTMX can put you in a position where you can use JavaScript in that way. And so that makes, uh, I think that, uh, in that in that way, HTMX is pro JavaScript in that it lets JavaScript be what it's best at and doesn't force it to be everything uh, in web development. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, I, I'm really stoked to see it. JS Nation happening November 18th and 21st online. If you want more information, click the link in the description, jsnation.com, and you can yep. get your ticket. And uh, I'll be there and checking out Carson's talk, and I can't wait to see it. So thank you so much, Carson, for your time. Yeah, no problem. I'll be there in person, too. So I'm, I'm flying fly in. So I'll see you guys there. Yeah, I'll see you there. Cheers.